America's greatest cities. Through corruption, violence, and genuine charm, the Irish mob rules the underworld. I'm only mad! For over 150 years, they would battle the mafia. Don't you tell me you're gonna tell me that? The government. And at times, each other. And a nation will be drenched in blood. In the age of the Mafia Don, the powerful Russian Mafia, and the Latin American Narco Traficante, who would believe that the oldest criminal group pilfering and plundering the stars and stripes is the Irish mob. The legacy of the Irish mob really is that it created a framework, a framework that became the foundation of organized crime in the United States. So many people think that it began with the Italian Mafia in the United States, but we see now that that's not true, that it began with the earliest formations of the Irish mob in places like New York and Chicago and Boston, and it continued and even grew throughout the 19th century and into the 20th century. But unlike La Cosa Nostra's famed organized structure of dons, capos, and soldiers, the Irish mob is made up of lone wolves who operate on a local level. The Italians were probably smarter in that sense. They built in all sorts of buffers between the top guy and the bottom. The Irish guys, I think, were more flamboyant. You know, most of them, I think, had this sort of real sense of, you know, they were tough guys and they were willing to prove it with their fists. You know, they weren't hiding behind 20 different guys and layers of protection. There's a certain dark side to the Irish. Any group that has been kept down for as many years as the Irish were kept down in Ireland, it, there's a certain rage and a certain anger that only comes out of repression. And we can tap into that. And when you get a guy who can really tap into it, he can do some serious damage. And in its entire brutal history, no mobster does more damage than a good old-fashioned Irish gangster from South Boston the highest ranking organized crime figure on the FBI's 10 most wanted list, James Whitey Bulger. No one called him Whitey. It was Jimmy. He certainly didn't call it to him to his face. <laughs> no way. No, no. He didn't do it. Fairy tale out in the Boston area was what he was like, Robin Hood. He was grabbing from the rich and giving to the poor. And it was such, it was so opposite of what he was actually doing. But he was very good at putting out that image. Merry Christmas. Thanks a lot. For over a half century, the Bulger image would have two sides. One would be Whitey's and the other, his brother Billy's. You had families that had politicians or professional people or cops, and then one brother might be a cop, the other brother might be a gangster, a stone killer. During World War II, in the Bulger home in South Boston's Old Harbor housing projects, two brothers couldn't have more opposite ambitions. Whitey was the black sheep of the family, was in trouble with the law from a very young age, starting in his teens, really. Whereas, on the other hand, Billy Bulger was almost the opposite. While younger brother Billy is heading for a life of academic achievement and a distinguished political career in the State House, Whitey is destined for a life of crime and a stint in the Big House. Bulger was absolutely vicious. He had a reputation of having a really quick temper. He did time for bank robbery back from 1956 to 1965, served time in Alcatraz, he uh, becomes a different kind of person. He settles down quite a bit so that by the time he gets out of prison, he's more cunning, he's smarter, he's more diabolical. Whitey vows never to go back to prison. He spends weeks after his release developing aliases, forging licenses, and planning for the future if he has to spend it on the run. But back in Boston, State Representative Billy is waiting for his paroled brother. 
was perceived that Billy had Whitey whenever he needed something done, sitting in the background, and Whitey had Billy whenever he needed something done. You're not going to cross Billy Budget. You might argue with him in the State House or whatever, but how hard are you going to go against him when you know his brother might kill you? His brother was known to go up to uh, investigative reporters and put guns to the head and, and tell them, as if you're writing more, I'm blowing your head off. Occasionally, while Billy's out campaigning, Whitey shows up. Whether it was that intimidation factor of another candidate, I mean, who can say? But everybody knew what Whitey was about. Jimmy was a really scary guy. He was legitimately scary. And he had these eyes, and you felt like you were talking to Satan. I mean, I, I liken him to a, a dark cloud that used to hover over, over this, this area. And it was always in the sky. Rain, rain or shine, that dark cloud was there, and periodically a lightning bolt would burst from, from that cloud and hit something on the ground. When that thing hit the ground, someone was dead. The final ingredient in the Bulger perfect storm will be a childhood acquaintance from Southie named John Connolly. John Connolly was 11 years younger than Whitey Bulger, and there's a story about John getting into a fight where he was really outnumbered. John Connolly was playing on a local ball field in Southie, and he was being picked on by three or four bullies. Whitey Bulger was passing through the park at the time, and he recognized John Connolly as a local kid, and he came to John Connolly's defense. Thank you. And that began a relationship between Connolly and the Bulgers. But the one that really had the relationship with John Connolly growing up in the project was Billy. I mean, Billy really became a mentor for John Connolly, and John has said that it was Billy who convinced him that he should go try to get a job with the FBI. By the mid-70s, John Connolly is a rising star in the Boston FBI. Billy Bulger is state senator. And James Whitey Bulger is making his moves to take over the rackets. We have Bulger made his money was really through bookmaking and loan shocking and taking money, you know. They didn't just shake down drug dealers, but they also threatened real estate agents, businessmen. You hear me? You turn me. No! There was a little room in this tavern upstairs um, over in Southie, and they would call their victims in, and if you were summoned to triple O's, you knew you had a problem. He was known to grab you, kidnap you right off the street, pull you in the back room, start cutting off body parts. Where's the money? He's worth millions of dollars, but he'd kill you for 10 grand. And that's what you were dealing with. But as tough and ruthless as Whitey is, I want to get paid, I want to get paid today! He's also smart enough to know that in order to rule the city, he and his crew are going to need some help. Bulger decides to form an alliance with Steve Flemmy an Italian-American contract killer known as the Rifleman. And he was a sharpshooter with a rifle. And in the old days, during the gang wars, Stevie would be in the backseat with the gyroscope, and they'd pull alongside the car along the expressway 50 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour, and they'd open up on you through the back window. Perfect shot every time. While Whitey controls South Boston, the Italian Mafia controls the North End. And it is Bulger's partnership with Fleming that allows him to take over the town. The Italian gangsters didn't really trust Whitey Bulger. They feared him, they respected him, but I don't think there was a lot of trust. They did trust Steve Flemmy. So Flemmy was able to get information out of the Italian mob that Bulger never could have got. In the mid and late 1970s, the mafia is experiencing the Godfather phenomena, and its national prominence has made La Cosa Nostra the FBI's number one target. I think law enforcement people by nature are very competitive and I think a lot of these agents were being driven very hard to develop intelligence and to develop sources in organized crime. For John Connolly, the Mafia provides a proving ground and his childhood protector, Whitey Bulger, provides the link that will raise them to a seemingly untouchable status. Whitey Bulger was looked at as a very important source of information by the FBI. To have John Connolly develop a relationship 
with a person like a Whitey Bulger was important to them. The power trio of lawman, politician, and gangster converge, and Whitey is now impenetrable. He is very, very intelligent, calculating individual, uh, with, you know, with a very, very strong criminal mind. What he had supporting him was a lot of people in strong positions within the community that could help him. They owned the city. They were the princes of the city. They went wherever they want. Over the next two decades, the duo of Bulger and Flemmy would become known to the world as the most homicidal gangster partnership in the history of the Irish-American underworld. A saga that began 150 years ago. When the Irish immigrant arrived in America, starving, penniless, and hated. In the late 1970s, James Whitey Bulger is the shining beacon of Boston's gangland. He is on the cusp of becoming one of the most notorious Irish-American gangsters in history. A saga that begins in the port of Boston in the 1840s. The Irish immigrant in the mid-1800s was usually a half-starved individual, an Irish Catholic, somebody who had survived uh, what was basically the European Holocaust. From the 16th century to the mid-19th century, Ireland is a harsh and dreary place under British rule. You have this peasantry that lives in a kind of continual turmoil and revolt against the upper classes, the Anglo-Irish. There are all sorts of secret societies that they have to protect themselves. There's a real tradition of violence against the authorities. For over three centuries, the oppressive colonial system was forced at the lash and the hangman's noose. But in 1845, the tenant farmer and the rural resistance are faced with a far greater foe. Their sole product, the means of living, is halted by a tiny agricultural virus. The Irish famine has become almost a joke now. Ah, oh, the potato famine, you know. But it was actually this sort of European holocaust. It was this horrendous famine that was exacerbated by the fact that British authorities who ran Ireland at the time did nothing really to help it. And as a result, about a million and a half people died. Many of them with their mouths green from eating grass, just falling along the side of the road. With their economy and food crop decimated, between 1845 and 1855, a million and a half people die. Others see no option but to flee to America in hopes of a new and better life. More than one million Irish cross into lower Manhattan in New York City. There's no immigration after like that. It overwhelms the social services of the city, it overwhelms the prisons, the asylums, and it creates a new city. They have to make it up from the minute they get off the ship. Most of them have never been in a village, never mind a city. And the first order of life is where do I get enough to eat and where do I live? In Boston, the Irish settle in the south. In New York, it is lower Manhattan an area known as Five Points. The conditions in the Five Points were miserable. There was squalor, poverty, a type of poverty that's probably unimaginable to us now. Um, the main tenement building in the neighborhood was a brewery factory that had been converted into living quarters. <coughs> the average apartment in the Five Points holds six to a room. There is little light and endless hours of darkness. But on the streets of Five Points, life holds opportunity 
there's scam artists and people looking to do business. And that's where the earliest gangs began to form, street corner gangs, young immigrant men, boys really, who had arrived, were living in fear, were preyed upon by others and started to form gangs. And that became the legendary gangs of New York. Protestant America is appalled. Derogatory nicknames like Puck, Harps, and these narrow backs proliferate among the ruling class. There was a series of cartoons in the newspapers depicting the early Irish immigrants that were all unflattering and the term Patty was used quite a bit because so many of them were named Patrick. Well, the Irish reaction to the extreme prejudice and bigotry they encountered was to get mad, but also to get even. You don't like us? Well, too bad. We're going to become the majority, and we're going to organize ourselves politically, we're going to organize ourselves in gangs, and we will now take over your city. The Irish descent on the vaunted corridors of New York's Tammany Hall in the mid-19th century is a way to get social acceptance and jobs. Tammany Hall began in the 1770s as a private business club formed by men who were looking for a way to form an organization that would have influence over the political process. By the 1850s, Captain Isaiah Reinders, a German-American patron of Tammany, runs the Empire Club in Lower Manhattan. This gambling parlor and political clubhouse is famous throughout New York. He was perhaps the first person in the United States to formulate this nexus between the criminal element, the sporting man, that is the dandy, and also the political apparatus. And this triptych of those three elements, the gangster, the sporting man, and the politician, really became the foundation of the American underworld. The gangs of New York are employed by Tammany primarily as a way of winning elections elections were often very violent affairs in which uh, gangs clashed and gangs were used to patrol the voting areas and to intimidate people. In return, Tammany takes care of their own. The main thing Tammany has to offer through patronage is jobs. To the victors go the spoils. And when you won a city election, a state election, you decided who was going to work in all the civic jobs. And Tammany was very good at creating more municipal jobs and of deciding who would get them. In the 1850s, the alliance between the gangs of New York and Tammany Hall quickly ushers in an Irish power hold over Five Points and other immigrant neighborhoods. One man by the name of John Morrissey establishes himself among all the Irish gangs. He arrived in New York in 1850 and he went directly to the Empire Club and he walked right in the door and he introduced himself to everyone there and said he was the toughest pugilist on the eastern seaboard and he was there to prove it. And of course he had the living daylight beat out of him. <laughs> Rinders himself was so impressed by this act of sheer bravado or foolishness that he put him up in the club until he could recover. Morrissey works as a political organizer for Isaiah Rinders, and his growing reputation as a fighter earns him popularity, an unwavering following, and an endearing nickname. Morrissey was called Old Smoke because of how his, uh, his pants went on fire uh, when he was pushed against the working stove during a particularly brutal brawl one evening. Onlookers said they could smell the stench of his skin burning, but Old Smoke never uttered a word of complaint. The money he made as a boxer, he parlayed into starting up his own gambling operations. He opened some gambling parlors in the Five Points neighborhood, and he became very popular along those lines, and eventually he became the de facto leader of the Irish immigrant population in the Five Points, who wanted to see one of their own rise up to the position that Captain Isaiah Reinders was at. 
1857, a major riot breaks out between the Dead Rabbits, the preeminent Irish-American gang in Lower Manhattan, and the Bowery Boys, the preeminent gang of native-born American young men. The riot lasts two days, and 12 people are killed. The police called in Captain Isaiah Rinders to try to settle this riot. Rinders came to the streets and tried to stop the riot, and he was pelted with debris, and he was chased out of the area. And really, it was kind of a disgrace for Rinders. And that was the point at which John Morrissey emerged as the leader of specifically the Dead Rabbits. But in a more general sense, he became the first Irish-American mob boss. Morrissey's first order as boss is to expand his already vast gambling empire. And in 1863, he aligns himself with William Marcy Tweed, Tammany Hall's grand sacum or boss. Tammany always understood and accepted what it considered the normal vices of men, uh, drinking, gambling, going to whorehouses. These were things it was willing to tolerate within certain limits as long as it got a big cut. But Old Smoke wants more than money. He runs for the U.S. Congress in 1868 and wins. But in another quest, he finds only misery. Morrissey yearned to be a part of the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant aristocracy. He tried to move into some of the ritzier parts of town, and he met a great degree of resistance everywhere he went, which was saddening and surprising to him because he discovered that although the aristocrats would patronize his gambling establishments, that he himself, to them, was just another patty. In 1877, John Morrissey dies of pneumonia. He may not have gone out the way he had hoped. But Old Smoke had laid the groundwork for a thriving underworld and proves that an Irishman from the gutter could take on the world. That battle is now won. America is going to be a multi-ethnic immigrant country and the Irish are going to be the leading immigrant group for the next 50 years. And the way the Irish do this is through that same trinity of the gangster, the lawman, the politician. The Irish come to dominate the police. They come to dominate the politics and they come to dominate the gangs. But Irish ascendancy in America is not guaranteed. A group perceived to be lower in rank arrives in search of a new beginning. Down in the swamps of Louisiana, America's mysterious new gangster emerges. And for the first time, the Italian mafia tries to dip its black hand into what little Patty has stuffed in his pockets. As the Irish gang struggle for jobs and acceptance in 19th century America, a new foe emerges from Sicily. The battle between the so-called Dagos and the Mix begins in hellish, swampy southern Louisiana in the city of New Orleans. And the Irish had no sense of where New Orleans was, and they were told that it was just a day away from Albany or Boston or New York. The living conditions were horrible. The climate to them was as if they had arrived on a distant planet of some type. But the one thing there was there was work. There was work digging the systems of canals and levees that became the foundation for the city of New Orleans. Some 20,000 Irishmen meet their deaths in those canals, most from cholera. But the Irish persevere, and many start finding jobs in the police and fire departments. Among those is a young New Orleans policeman named David C. Hennessy. David Hennessy was a policeman who eventually rose to the rank of chief of the New Orleans Police Department. And he was very popular in New Orleans. He founded his reputation on taking on a new criminal scourge in the United States and was known as the Sicilian Black Hand. It really was the forerunner of what would come to be known as the Mafia. But Hennessy is doing more than simply taking on the Mafia. In the spring of 1890, he chooses sides in a Sicilian turf war. By the fall, he would have to pay for his sins. In 
On the night of October 15, 1890, Chief Hennessy was on his way home. Gunmen emerged out of the fog and opened fire. He then collapsed in the street. While Hennessy lay dying on the cobblestone street, he was asked who did it. And right before the chief died, he whispered, Dagos. The chief was dead. This was a major incident in the history of New Orleans. The police chief at that time was a beloved figure. Italian suspects are rounded up and a trial ensues. Despite the public's demand for justice, a jury finds the nine defendants not guilty. What follows will go down as one of the most shocking events in the city's history. The populace was so upset about this acquittal that they stormed into the jail and they pulled a number of these men right out of the jail and 11 Italian Americans assumed to be mafia members were hung in the town square. This was a, a turning point, a major incident, not only the history of the city, but it also became sort of the opening salvo in what would become a long-running theme in the American underworld, and that was the war between the Italians and the Irish, the war between the Dagos and the Mix. About 1,000 miles north of New Orleans is a place known as Mud City. In the mid-19th century, Chicago, is an opportunity waiting to happen, especially for anyone with a touch of larceny in their soul. And one of the first men to seize this opportunity is an Irish American from Niagara Falls named Michael Cassius McDonald. You had your gamblers, you had the earliest version of the labor racketeer, you had your, uh, your vice operators. Mike was the one that really united them all, except for prostitution. One of his aides always said, a crook has to be decent to work with Mike, so no pimps. In 1873, King Mike opens up a gambling emporium unlike anything ever seen in Chicago. He simply calls it the store. He opened this multi-story building and his partner looked at him and he said, Mike, this is all going for gambling? And he said to his friend, oh, don't worry about it. There's a sucker born every minute. During the years of his reign, Mike McDonald never holds elective office. For decades, he remains the proverbial man behind the man, a powerful figure that would shape the long history of the Irish underworld. One of the secrets of the success of the Irish mob was the man who really controlled the strings of power was not the public figure, was not the person who held political office. Mike McDonald was a classic example of this. Mike McDonald was the one who gave birth to the mayor of Chicago, who became known as Our Carter, Carter Harrison. With Our Carter in his hip pocket, King Mike fleeces the city through a stream of bribes and fraudulent contracts. And despite 40 years of nefarious activity, he will never spend a single day in jail. By the turn of the century, King Mike's reign is coming to an end. And the two men who succeed him will take pride in parading in the spotlight. Two of the most colorful characters to emerge in Chicago in the post-Mike McDonnell years were John Bathhouse John Coughlin <laughs> and then Michael Hinky Dink Kenna. They were the aldermen in the Southside Levy District in Chicago. The First Ward's Levy District is the hub of crime and vice in Chicago. Prostitutes, liquor, and gambling net nearly $60 million a year. But in 1896, Hinky Dink and the Bath elevate debauchery to heights never before seen in Chicago or anywhere else in America. <laughs> The first Ward Ball was a legendary event that took place once a year in Chicago. It was established as a fundraiser, basically, in which they would have a big Roman party. All the criminals from the city would buy tickets and show up, and they would party alongside the preeminent political figures and also the preeminent law enforcement figures. It was always held at a place called the Coliseum. An orgy would take place at around midnight, where the doors would be locked to the public, everybody would go crazy. Some reporters who stayed around to witness it said afterward it was just like watching Rome after it had been sacked. 
religious leaders issue a report claiming that the levy represents the end of civilization as we know it, a veritable Sodom and Gomorrah. In the decades that follow, temperance advocates spearhead a noble experiment that not only changes the face of the Irish American gangster, but reshapes American society. <laughs> By the turn of the 20th century, Patty now runs New York and Chicago. You guys gotta stand up for yourself. And you 50 short years after arriving in America, the Irish mob have both cities drenched in prostitution, gambling, and corruption. Disdain for gangsters reaches an all-time high, and on January 19, 1919, temperance leaders strike what they think will be the decisive blow on the war on vice. The 18th Amendment is ratified by Congress, and one year later, making, selling, or drinking booze is prohibited across the United States. When people refer to the Noble Experiment, they're talking about prohibition. This was uh, the movement uh, to eradicate not only the concept of drinking alcohol, but to eradicate the concept of the saloon. The, the thinking being that if you got rid of the saloon, you'd get rid of all vice, you'd get rid of the mobster and the gangster. Liquor is an important part of the Irish life. These are people who come from a rainy, cold, windswept island in which there's an indoor culture and you talk and you smoke and you drink and you have this sense of camaraderie. Prohibition was designed by a Protestant elite to keep the Catholic, urban and Jewish animals in their place. And what happened, ironically, because of prohibition, you created a real genuine power in these urban centers that hadn't existed and placed it in the hands of the underclass in America. For the Irish-American gangster, prohibition was the greatest thing that could have happened. It really ushered in the glory day of the Irish-American mobster. In Chicago, one stout, cheery-faced Irishman with twinkling blue eyes is primed and ready for his shot at newfound wealth and power. Dean O'Banion is born in 1892 and at the age of nine is brought to Chicago to live with his grandparents in an area known as Little Hell. In December 1919, just before Prohibition came into effect, he was walking down uh, Chicago Street, trying to walk by a hotel, and a liquor truck was parked in the alley. So O'Banion, out of curiosity, walked up to the truck and he lifted up the tarp, and he saw all these cases of Groms and all rich whiskey stacked there. So as soon as the driver unrolled his window, O'Banion took a roll of nickels out of his pocket, knocked him unconscious, and drove off with the liquor. And he said afterwards, I had all this uh, liquid gold, what was I going to do with it? It was all distributed among saloon keepers. O'Banion walked home with $15,000 in his pocket. He knew what he was going to do for the rest of his life. Bootlegging was better than prostitution, was better than gambling, because there were built-in cultural taboos about prostitution and gambling. Everybody knew those were wrong on some level. But drinking, which had been right in 1919, is suddenly wrong in 1920. This was the insanity of prohibition. So there was no way not to make money off this, because they were actually just giving people what they want. O'Banion saw bootlegging pretty much as a business. He didn't see himself as a criminal. He had a flower shop in Chicago that was probably the most successful flower shop in all Chicago. They supplied the flowers to the various gangland shootings that took place all throughout Chicago during this era. In 1924, he is declared Chicago's arch criminal, having allegedly killed or ordered the killing of at least 25 men. What Prohibition did was turn the Irish gangster from a politician's attack dog into the top dog. You've created this juggernaut, you've turned these three corner thugs into feudal lords, and now the paradigm is shifting. Now the gangsters are saying, well, wait a minute, why should I listen to you? What are you going to do to me? But you know what I can do to you, which is basically, you know, put you in a shallow grave. Nowhere is this shift in power more apparent than in New York City where the once formidable Tammany Hall will become the tool of an Irish gangster from New York's west side. <laughs> 
Oni Madden achieved prominence as a young criminal in Hell's Kitchen, as a member of the Gopher Gang. He really was a kind of classic American street tough. His very first murder was of an Italian named Luigi Malinucci. And Madden had shot him in cold blood, in full daylight, in front of everybody, and said, I'm Oni Madden of 10th Avenue. Of 10th Avenue! All the witnesses conveniently forgot they had ever seen him. And that's how he got the nickname Oni the Killer. Oni joins forces with a pioneer rum runner and wealthy bootlegger businessman by the name of Big Bill Dwyer. With Dwyer's bankroll backing him, Madden sets about organizing the underworld. The Big Bill Dwyer Oni Madden operation was so successful it even became known as the Combine. The Combine ruled everything. The Combine was the system of distribution, the system of payoffs, all of it connected to the booze rackets. In early 1924, the Combine opens the massive Phoenix Cereal Beverage Company in the heart of Manhattan. The beer is called Madden's Number One. Oni and the Combine take care of Tammany, and Tammany in return takes care of the Prohibition agents and the police. Money from the Prohibition rackets was used to finance political campaigns. The DA's office, in many cases, was in on it. So many people were involved that it had really infected the entire American system of government. The man in Tammany who greases the wheels for Madden and the Combine is a cunning Irish-American named James J. Hines. Jimmy Hines became the money man, the man that the payoffs were made to, the man who distributed the money to the corrupt policemen and the corrupt politicians. With Dwyer and Hines firmly behind Madden, New York is in the hands of the Irish mob. Only in the Combine establish a string of popular nightclubs and speakeasies providing another outlet for Madden's number one. Only Madden, who had once been this street thug from Hell's Kitchen, became quite the man about town. He became a snazzy dresser. He hung out on Broadway at many of the places where the Broadway writers and journalists and song and dance men hang out. And so you had this confluence of the criminal underworld and the high society world in a way that it had never existed before. They're like the hippest, coolest people that you can imagine. They run the clubs, they bring the beer, they bring the entertainers. There's no better representation of that transfer where you go from kind of patty of the streets to this nightclub type than Jimmy Cagney. Jimmy Cagney grew up in New York, looked very much like Oni Madden. Cagney knew him. If you look at Cagney in all of the great Cagney gangster movies, you're again looking at Oni Madden. Jimmy Cagney, who was very much a New York Irish American, was cast in these roles that really popularized the image of the sort of urban Irish, you know, that, that sort of smart, charismatic, daring character. While Hollywood glamorizes the daring exploits of Irish gangsters, city officials are out drinking with them. This love affair with the Irish reaches new heights in 1926 when Jimmy Walker, a slick former Tin Pan Alley songwriter, is elected mayor in New York City. He's a guy, the son of Irish immigrants, grew up in Greenwich Village, and he basically was handpicked to become mayor in 1925 by the Tammany Machine. He was the, the darling of Broadway, he was the darling of high society in a lot of ways. And he really sort of laid to rest the whole sort of dumb patty, you know, off the boat kind of, you know, goonish stereotype that had been propagated through the press and the media. The Roaring Twenties are in full gear with Madden, Hines and Walker running the show in New York and Dini O'Banion in Chicago. The cities are green from shamrocks and money. And thanks to the underworld, Patty has finally arrived. This prohibition era of the 1920s really was the glory years, not only for the Irish American mobster, but in many ways it was the period at which the Irish-American and the squalor of the post-famine years had now come through the 19th century and reached this level of social ascendancy in which it was actually swell to be a mick. However popular and powerful the Irish had become, waiting and plotting to take them down 
are the Italian Mafia. The war between the Italians and the Irish is about to determine the course of organized crime in America for generations to come. Ever since the first wave of Sicilians arrived in America in the late 19th century, Italian and Irish gangs are heading for a showdown. But nowhere is their rivalry more heated than in Chicago. Prohibition has made Dino Banyan, the Windy City's most notorious gangster, and the minute Alphonse Scarface Capone comes to town in 1919, he sets his sights on the Irishman's empire. So by the time Capone arrives in Chicago, it's a Chicago in which Dino Bannon is the preeminent bootlegger in the city, an Irishman, an Irish-American. Capone aligns himself with the operation of Johnny Torrio. Johnny Torrio, who was Al Capone's mentor, was the one that really unified bootlegging in Chicago. O'Banion was operating independently as a bootlegger in the north side at that time. Johnny Torrio was the one who came forward and said all of the primary gangs should stick together. So this agreement was what allowed O'Banion to build his empire unmolested. In the early 20s, O'Banion deals with Torrio because it makes good business sense. But Torrio's sidekick, Al Capone, warns him of O'Banion's treachery. Dini is overheard on a number of occasions to say, you can tell them Sicilians to go to hell. Again? One day, O'Banion goes to Johnny Torrio and he says, my uh, brewery, the Sieben Brewery, do you want the Sieben? So he sold the Sieben to Torrio for half a million dollars, neglecting to tell him that it was targeted for a raid. So the morning of May 19th, 1924, Torrio and O'Banion are on the Sieben brewery premises when a raiding party led by Chief Morgan Collins comes bursting in. And everybody is arrested. And O'Banion was in great humor. But Torrio, because it was a second arrest, it carried a mandatory jail sentence. The Italians are enraged by Dini's backstabbing. O'Banion's fate is now sealed in a carefully devised plan by Capone and is executed on the morning of November 10th, 1924. I want it done now! Don't you tell me it can't be done! O'Banion's murder was called the handshake murder because that morning, three men came into his shop to pick up an order that had been placed for a funeral the night before. The man shaking Dini's hands pulled him forward and pinned his arms down. The other gunman stepped forward and fired five shots. The last one fired into his brain. The blood from Dini began to stain the lily white bouquet of flowers that he had in his hands. And by the time the cops had arrived, Dini was dead. Three days later, Chicago witnesses the largest funeral ever held in the city. O'Banion had been revered. One of the members of his gang was uh, George Bugs Moran. Moran was, was dedicated to the elimination of Al Capone. In January 1925, Bugs Moran opened fire on Johnny Torrio outside his home on Clyde, on Clyde Avenue and nearly killed him. And that was open season. Sensing the entire system is about to disintegrate, Torrio leaves Chicago and hands the entire operation over to Capone. It's all yours, Al, he tells Capone on his way out of town. I'm not ready to die. You're talking about an era in which there may have been 250 to 300 gang-related murders over a four- or five-year period. This death struggle will finally culminate on Valentine's Day, 1929. On the morning of February 14th, gunmen dressed as police officers enter a Moran-owned warehouse claiming it is a bust. They line up members of Moran's gang against the wall and mow them down in cold blood. 
to a city and nation numb to the violence of prohibition, the headlines are shocking. The violence of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre turned the public completely. It was the end of the heyday of the gangster. The gangster at that point largely went underground. On May 13, 1929, three months after the slaughter on St. Valentine's Day, a gathering of the country's biggest mobsters takes place in Atlantic City, New Jersey. The conference is organized by Lucky Luciano and Meyer Lansky of the New York Syndicate. Yeah. Curiously, out of the 30 mobsters present, only two are Irishmen. Frank McElane of Chicago, who works for Capone, and New York's Oni Madden. It was the beginning of a new world order in which the Sicilian and Italian and Jewish gangsters were going to move the Irish gangsters to the fringe, take over their relationships with the politicians, and create a framework in which the Irish gangster outlaw would be kept out of the picture. But two tough, rogue Irish gangsters, Vincent Mad Dog Cole and Jack Legs Diamond, are not going down without a fight. The Irish gangsters were more often were kind of lone wolf tough guys. Characters like Mad Dog Cole and Legs Diamond, who were just basically sociopathic or psychopathic gunmen who didn't have the smarts and organizational skills to go on beyond being street corner thugs. But they sure cut a, you know, a, a bloody and horrible swath across the end of that era. As the lone Irishman left at the table, the tall order of eliminating these renegades falls on Oni, the killer Madden. Now Patty will have to whack Patty in order to survive. Madden and Dwyer saw Legs Diamond as a threat, and so he needed to be eliminated. And it began a period of trying to kill Jack Legs Diamond, and Jack was shot numerous times. He was shot five times. There was an all-out attempt to get Jack Diamond and eliminate him. In 1930, Legs flees the five boroughs in a hail of bullets. He moves his operation to upstate, just outside of Albany, New York. But his personal assault on the syndicate continues. One time, he pulled over some delivery trucks that he felt were trucks from a rival bootlegging operation in upstate New York. He kidnapped the driver of the truck, a gentleman by the name of Parks. He took Parks back to his property. They hung him up in a tree and tortured him for an hour and a half and threatened him and then let him loose. Parks goes to the authorities and Diamond is put on trial in Albany in 1931. He is acquitted but time and luck are running out on legs. He was acquitted, but the fact that Diamond had become such a notorious figure and that he was being sort of glorified in the press made the Combine in New York more determined than ever to take him out. At 5.30 in the morning on December 18th, 1931, Legs Diamond stumbles into an Albany boarding house where he has been staying. He was a little tipsy after celebrating from his victory. A couple of gunmen were allowed into the boarding house. They approached his room, opened the door. So it was an inside job. So they made sure they got it done right this time, up close and personal, two shots to the head, and Jack Diamond was finally dead. Madden has finally gotten rid of legs. But for Oni and the syndicate, Diamond is only half of the equation. Vincent Mad Dog Cole is still out there wreaking havoc. He picked a fight with every single gangster in New York City. This was not the key to longevity in gangland. And Mad Dog Cole is famous for a couple of things, one of which is he's the originator of the drive-by shooting. In 1929, Cole attempts to eliminate one of the underlings of renowned New York gangster, Dutch Schultz. In East Harlem, he opens fire from the backseat of a traveling vehicle. 
Cole sprays the street with gunfire, hitting a number of people, including a five-year-old boy who was killed. And this, of course, set the New York City newspapers ablaze. And he became known as Mad Dog Call. And really, from that moment on, once he had killed that kid, he was a dead man. In the winter of 1931, Cole turns himself in, stands trial, and like Jack Diamond before him, is acquitted. In the wake of this trial, everyone knows that Cole is going to get taken out. So he wants to broker a way out of this. And so he reaches out to the only person he knows, the fellow Irishman, Oni Madden. Oni agrees to talk to Cole just after midnight on February 8th, 1932. Mad Dog is directed to a local phone booth. Call goes from his hotel room on West 23rd Street to a corner pharmacy and candy store where there's a phone booth and he calls Oni Madden. Oni Madden holds Mad Dog Call on the line while the gunmen make their way to West 23rd Street. You out of your mind. I never saw anyone on the street that looked like a gun. I know how to They said it was such a great hit that the phone booth was hardly damaged. All the glass was gone. Call was as dead as a doornail. But otherwise, the phone booth came out in pretty good shape. Only the killer, Madden, may have prolonged his own survival by turning on two of the most notorious hoodlums in Irish gangland. But in doing so, he has brought a violent end to the glory years of the tough Irish street gangster. By the mid-1930s, the war between the Italians and the Irish is being won by the Italians. And less than 100 years after the famine Irish come to America, the Irish-American mobster appears on the verge of extinction. In the late 1920s and early 30s, Rival bootleggers turn streets from New York to Chicago into bloodbaths. The alarming body count will accelerate the repeal of Prohibition in 1933. And without illegal booze to peddle, the lone wolf Irish gangster is at the mercy of the organization and power of the Italian Mafia. Oni Madden is allowed to basically retire to Hot Springs, Arkansas. He becomes the uh, impresario of what is basically a resort town for gangsters on the lam. Once that happens, the Irish are done as a gangland criminal force. He really is the end of that great line of Irish gangster succession. Uh, there's almost nowhere for it to go after him. In the mid-1930s, the government and Protestant aristocracy crusade to dismantle the powerful men behind Patty's political machines. New York Governor Franklin Roosevelt establishes a panel to investigate corruption and appoints retired judge Samuel Seabury. Well, Seabury is this almost cartoonish representation of the Protestant elite. So Seabury is going to be the slayer of the Tammany Tiger. And so what happens is you have this series of investigations that start by looking into the magistrates and then the judges and then, you know, eventually into, into City Hall itself. The prosecution of uh, racketeers and gangsters. For decades, the Tammany Tiger has been the force of nature that powers the Irish-American underworld. But in 1932... Broadway darling and popular mayor Jimmy Walker is forced to resign and in January 1939 Jimmy Hines the quintessential man behind the man is convicted on 13 counts of conspiring with criminals what you were seeing here in New York and in Chicago and some of the other places where the Irish American gangster had reigned supreme was the death of the machine, which really was pulling out the rug from underneath the entire power of the Irish mob. By the early 1940s, 
Irish gangsters looking to do business in the underworld must return to the very same waters that brought them to America almost 100 years before. The docks will soon emerge as the most lucrative market for the Irish mob since Prohibition. The ILA became a very powerful institution here in New York because the, uh, because the New York port was the largest and most significant port in the United States, probably the most significant port in the world for, uh, uh, for much of the 20th century. With a national membership of over 100,000, the International Longshoremen's Association controls the flow of legal and illegal cargo that arrives every 15 minutes throughout New York. For 26 years, the man who rules this empire of organized thievery is a thick, barrel-chested Irishman known to his workforce simply as Boss Joe. Joe Ryan was a god. He would stand up there, he would pound the gavel to bring the meeting to order, and everybody would just go dead silent. And in the audience were gangsters carrying guns. You can have your name on one of the pre Joe Ryan was a very smart guy. He also didn't hesitate to commit violence. Boss Joe's grip on the docks and the cargo that passes through is assured through the shape-up system. The notorious way of deciding who gets to work down on the waterfront. There were guys who used to be long showing years ago who used to show up and get favoritism because they were part of the mob by virtue of a little an ace of spades and a hat would say they're part of the crew, you hire them. Just as Tammany Hall employed the gangs of New York during elections a century earlier, Boss Joe deploys a squad of hoodlums to guarantee the vote. You know, during union elections, for instance, it was not uncommon for people to be bumped off. And usually when they were murdered, their bodies were hung somewhere or, or uh, you know, the message was delivered that if you go against the union, this is the likely result. Boss Joe's two most notorious muscle men are John Cockeye Dunn and Andrew Squint Sheridan. The clearest example of the viciousness of Cockeye Dunn and Squint Sheridan was a murder that happened in the late 1940s. They killed a member of the ILA. On the morning of January 8th, 1947, Andy Hintz, a hiring boss on the wrong side of Boss Joe, leaves his apartment in Greenwich Village. In front of his building, he is pumped with six bullets. Before Hintz expires, he tells his wife, Johnny Dunn shot me. At the trial, John Cockeye Dunn was found guilty. He was sentenced to death. We have the electric chair for guys like you. He and his sidekick, Squint Sheridan, were both put in the electric chair by the state of New York. God be with you. The crooked and cruel shape-up system inspires a stubborn but courageous priest who makes the waterfront his own personal parish. With that exception, I knew, but I never took it. You know why? No. His name is Father John Corridan. Now here's Charlie. He knows the right path. John Corden began to put pressure on various political interests to bring about change and he was able to do it in a way because he was a priest. If he had not been a priest, he probably would have got killed somewhere along the line. Father Corden's plight inspires the film On the Waterfront, starring Marlon Brando. Hollywood's inside look at life on the docks and the sensational trial and execution of Cockeye and Squint turned the tide against the corrupt forces within the ILA 
most notably Joe Ryan. What brought Joe Ryan down was his own greed. All money is the answer. I get more money? Joe Ryan, although he was presenting himself as a great advocate for his own uh, union members. This is my union. I built it. He was actually fleecing the union for his own personal gain. Do you understand what that means? In the early 1950s, Boss Joe admits to hiring convicted thieves and violent felons. He is sentenced to six months in prison and fades away. For the Irish gangster, lawman, and politician, it is the end of an era. But for the Irish, the 1960s will begin with a moment of triumph and lead to the bloodiest carnage yet. By the 1950s, the Irish have risen from the squalor and gutters of urban America. Their 100-year war against discrimination, the mafia, and the government to get their fair share of the stars and stripes is finally about to hoist one of their own into the White House. Joe Kennedy, I think, was very much fueled by this competitive nature to say, oh, yeah, why can't I? What do you mean I can't be this, you know? Uh, what do you mean I can't do that? Yes, I can, you know? It says right there, all men are created equal. Joseph P. Kennedy was born to Boston money in 1888. And by the age of 25, is the country's youngest bank president. But it is the noble experiment that will change the course of Joe's life. Joe Kennedy sees prohibition not so much as a way of accumulating more money, but as a way of connecting with the underworld. He was one of a very small handful of men who had the economic ability to actually import the booze into the country. And so he became a very uh, much a behind the scenes figure. By the mid 1920s, Kennedy is an alleged partner of Oni Madden in New York and the primary supplier of booze to Al Capone in Chicago. Joe Kennedy was able to use that connection to the streets, that connection to the universe of the Irish mob, that intersection of the political and the criminal and the law enforcement. He was willing to dabble in that world when it was to his advantage to do so. Over the next two decades, Joe Kennedy rides the American dream and amasses a fortune as he ascends from the underworld of bootlegging through the so-called upper world of stocks, Hollywood, and real estate. He's no longer economically connected directly to the underworld, but he still has these alliances that he's able to maintain over the years. Kennedy becomes this incredibly powerful rich man, then decides, you know, why stop at this, you know? What's the ultimate prize in America? You know, it's the presidency of the United States of America. With the days of illegal booze and gangster affiliations in his own closet, Papa Joe turns his attention to the political future of his son, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. During the Kennedy campaign of 1960, Joe Kennedy reached out to a lot of mobster figures that he either was directly affiliated with or, or had some kind of business relationship with over the years. Joe Kennedy was determined to leave no stone unturned in his efforts to get his son Jack Kennedy elected president. One of those people is Sam Momo Giancana, the head of the Chicago mob known as The Outfit, a successor to Capone's syndicate. 
Joseph Kennedy determines the gem of the prairie is one of the keys to his son's election. Joe Kennedy was desperate to have a son become president, and that came to the right person. Sam knew a lot of the union people. He knew the first ward especially, which was one of the biggest wards at that time. And that's where this all stemmed from. He has a series of meetings with Sam Giancana to make sure that the forces of the mob, in this case being mostly the Italians and the mafia, are going to be on board. He reassures them that the election of John Kennedy will be good for them. On November 11th, 1960, John Fitzgerald Kennedy becomes the 35th president of the United States. He wins by the slimmest margin in history. The difference? Key districts in Chicago. Not till the middle of the next day was the victory reclenched by one of the closest margins recorded. A lot changed, uh, even with the election of Kennedy, John Kennedy. You know, the days of saying, you know, we can't make it, we're over. We had made it, the Irish Catholics made it. We had elected one of our own presidents of the United States. In many respects, that was the best period of time. And at the same time, it was the beginning of the decline. Because once you say you've made it, then everything goes downhill after that. In 1960, JFK appoints his brother and the mob's number one nemesis, Robert Kennedy, as Attorney General. RFK announces that dismantling organized crime will be the highest priority of the Justice Department. Uh, Robert really went uh, out of his way to not just not give these guys what they thought was their spoils of this election, but to rub their faces in the fact that they were members of the underworld, that they were Italian, that they were bad guys, and seemed insanely obsessed with humiliating these very powerful men that have been business partners of his father. Need it. I think that uh, in the uh, field of organized crime, I think it's a very serious situation that's facing the country at the present time. Sam Giancana and the Mafia according to one theory, are enraged. He expected them primarily to lay low, and it did not happen that way, and I think there was a major disappointment. But he expected a little bit more freedom, but in turn, he got help from them in the very end. The old school guys were men of honor. They respected deals and uh, handshake agreements, and if I take care of you, take care of me. And if you don't, well, someone has to pay a price. In Dallas, on November 22nd, 1963, John F. Kennedy is assassinated. I think between the Kennedys and the Giancanas, it was like a little civil war amongst them, the Irish and the Italians. In the Italian culture, we have a saying, you don't bite the hand that feeds you. And I think this is precisely what had happened. The Kennedys bit the hand that fed them. And seen in that context, the events of November 22, 1963 can be viewed as the ultimate hit in the history of this relationship between the Dagos and the Mix. It's been said that America lost its innocence in the fall of 1963. And in the late 1960s, on the west side of Manhattan, a murderous rampage called the Houdini is about to take the violence to a new and sadistic level. Over the past century, the Irish mob is systematically dismantled by the mafia, the government, 
and at times each other. In New York, Patty's last stand will take place in the West Side neighborhood of Hell's Kitchen. In the late 1960s, it is ruled by the gentleman gangster, Mickey Spillane. If you could make it in Hell's Kitchen, instant notoriety throughout the city. My dad walked around in $5,000 suits and walked into restaurants and everybody knew him. And, you know, if he walked in a room, heads turned. You know, there, there was there was something magical about that. Hey, you know who that was? That was Mickey Spillane. The Mafia in New York wants to expand their already dominant grip on the rackets. And the 1960s usher in a new demon to steal men's souls. But Mickey Spillane is going to protect his turf. He wouldn't let drugs into the neighborhood. He, he wouldn't let his mob uh, sell drugs. But uh, that, that was uh, why the uh, Brooklyn mob uh, wanted to get rid of them. They wanted to bring in drugs. Well, Mickey was a powerhouse. What does he do? He starts to kidnap battalion gangsters, battalion bookmakers, high-powered guys. He would kidnap them and hold them for ransom and have the Italian mob pay him the ransom. But he made a huge, huge error. One of the people that he kidnapped was murdered. As a result of that, the hit, the contract went out on Mickey's plan. Over one shoulder, Spillane will have to watch out for the Italians. But over the other, he now has to watch for a new generation of Irish hoodlums coming of age in Hell's Kitchen. They were named the Westies by, you know, the Daily News. There were a couple of them that were really, really bad on the drugs, and, and they were the cancer. They were the cancer that was eating away at our neighborhood. And, you know, you'd walk into a bar and you'd see this guy, and you knew that there was going to be a problem. You, you absolutely knew that... You know, tonight somebody's going to get hurt. In the 1970s, the leader of the Westies is a young Irishman named Jimmy Coonan. Coonan gets his start collecting debts from legendary West Side loan shark, Ruby Stein. No, 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 thank you. It's really nice of you. Ruby Stein was known as the loan shark to the stars. Jimmy Coonan used that status to coalesce around himself a whole generation of young, tough West Side gangsters that began to look up to him as a leader and began to see him as someone who could move Spillane aside and take over the West Side racket. Coonan soon recognizes the need for a right-hand man. Someone who will watch his back and kill for him without conscience. Mickey Featherstone is another one of these young, tough, wayward guys in the neighborhood who went to Vietnam in 1967. And when he came back to Hell's Kitchen in 1969, he really was even worse off than, than he was before. Coonan befriends Featherstone and immediately initiates him into the grisly world of human dismemberment. They need a victim and decide on a small-time hood named Ricky Tassiello. They lured Ricky Tassiello to a uh, apartment on 10th Avenue and when Ricky Tassiello came into the apartment... Jimmy Coonan took a gun with a silencer and shot him twice in the head. And Jimmy Coonan began to cut up the body. Now, this was the first time Mickey Featherstone had seen 
a body cut up. Featherstone is at first sickened and vomits. Coonan then hands Mickey the knife and implores his young protege to plunge it into his chest as a gesture of gangland solidarity. I think Jimmy actually wasn't tough. You know, you don't have to do those things if you're tough. When he killed you, you know, he had to, you know, slice you up just to, you know, just to say, I, I told you that I'm the boss. Throughout the 1970s, bodies start disappearing on a regular basis as Coonan hacks his path to the top, making them do the Houdini is what Coonan calls his macabre ritual. His main goal was to take over Ruby Stein's Lone Shark book. It was a very arrogant and, and audacious move on his part. What they did was they lured Ruby Stein to a bar known as the 596 Club on 43rd Street. He enters the bar, sees immediately what the situation is, but there's nothing he can do now. Jimmy Coonan and four or five other members of the Westies gather around the body of Ruby Stein and Jimmy Coonan hands the gun to each one of the gang members and asks them to put a bullet in the already dead corpse of Ruby Stein. Coonan may have taken over Stein's book, but Mickey Spillane still runs Hell's Kitchen. Jimmy Coonan knew that he was never going to be boss of the West Side as long as, as Mickey Spillane was still around. And so Jimmy Coonan began to establish an alliance with the Gambino family based in Brooklyn, specifically through a capo in the Gambino family known as Roy DeMeo. Now, along with Coonan's unholy alliance with the dreaded mafia and the botched kidnapping of the Italian gangster, Mickey Spillane's days are coming to a close. It wasn't safe. I remember thinking, you know what, we would have been better off in Belfast because at least we would know who the enemy was. He was really scared. He lived in Queens. He moved out of uh, the West Side. He moved to Queens with his family because of the constant pressure uh, that was on his wife and kids. May 13, 1977, his bell rings. He came down to the street. He walked over to a car that was parked in the street, put his head in the car. The next day, DeMeo and Coonan meet in Hell's Kitchen, and DeMeo says, I gave you an early birthday present. We took out Mickey Spillane. The once proud Irish mob is now reduced to a murderous outfit with no code. A lot of the criminal element of the Westies felt that the Westies should be Irish. Hell's Kitchen, that's us right here. And it created this rivalry within the Westies. The Irish faction that wanted the neighborhood to stay Irish started to coalesce around Mickey Featherstone. Jimmy Coonan started to go in his own direction, almost as if he was an independent businessman working with the Italians. It surprised the Irish of Hell's Kitchen, like, how dare you, you know, how could you make this alliance with these, you know, scumbags that we've been trying to keep out of this neighborhood for a hundred years. Coonan, sensing his power base threatened by Featherstone, makes a sinister preemptive strike. He arranges a murder of a Westie's nemesis by the name of Michael Holly. The killer that day wore a sandy blonde wig, so his hair looked like Mickey Featherstone, and a lot of 
the usual suspects on the west side were rounded up, including Mickey Featherstone, who was put in a lineup, and all of a sudden people started identifying him in the lineup as the killer. Mickey Featherstone did not pull the trigger on this murder. It was set up to make it look like Mickey Featherstone had been the trigger man. Go, 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 go. Featherstone is found guilty of the Holly murder and turns state's evidence in order to get his conviction overturned. The types of violence that the Westies were uh, using against one another uh, was something that didn't really breed loyalty within the group. I mean, certainly they lasted for a number of years, but uh, once they began to, to fall apart, they fell apart pretty quickly. And that trial eventually came about in 1988 with Mickey Featherstone as the star witness against all of his former gang members in the Westies. It really felt like the passing of a, of a type of culture that had existed in that neighborhood going back about 120 years. Coonan is convicted and receives 75 years, ending the long reign of the Irish mob in New York's Hell's Kitchen. Patty the Gangster is now down to its final frontier, Boston. And its last boss, a man who just may be the most diabolical of them all. In the mid-1970s, La Cosa Nostra dominates America's underworld. Patty as a gangland force is all but eliminated in New Orleans, New York, and Chicago. But in Boston, one lone Irish gangster will make a last stand. Bulger's war was a war on paper. It was a war, behind the scenes war. He never had to go out and take on the mafia with a machine gun. He, did, he used the FBI to take them down. So, I mean, the, the, the FBI couldn't catch a cold in a pneumonia ward without their informants. But the whole world of law enforcement, it revolves around informants. They, and they had the top rat, king rat himself, Jimmy Bulger and Stevie Fleming, right from the get-go. Whitey is feeding information to his childhood friend from South Boston, Agent John Connolly of the FBI. And that connection, combined with the alleged influence of brother and state senator Billy Bulger, now makes Whitey an unstoppable force. That Whitey Bulger was the last of the last. Whitey Bulger was like a figure out of a Jimmy Cagney movie, a, a 1930s Warner Brothers gangster movie. He had, he had been able to exist long after the larger framework of the Irish mob had died out simply because he had this relationship of the gangster, the politician, and the lawman. Thank God you're my friend. By the mid-1980s, with the help of Bulger and his hitman Steve Fleming, Boston's most notorious Italian mafioso are behind bars. John Connolly is the toast of the town. And Whitey is untouchable. People in journalism were looking and saying, well, what about Whitey Bulger? Is he next? Is, that the, is he the next target? And there was a lot of agencies that were trying to give them the attention that we should be giving them. But time and time again, the investigations, for one reason or another, would get tipped. We'd get so far, but we would never be able to reach them. If someone was going to be a rat and went to the, the FBI for protection, willing to wear a wire, Jimmy Bulger would get a heads up from John Conley. Next thing you know, the guy's dead. And this happened all the time. That's scary. Who, who do you go? You're in trouble. Who are you going to run to? The police? In the late 1980s, Bulger and Fleming ruled Boston like feudal warlords, pilfering the neighborhood they call home, killing indiscriminately and without consequence. But like all the others before them, in 1990, the luck of the Irish will run out. We hit one of the top bookmakers in Boston. He had firsthand 
relationships with Bulger and Fleming. And eventually we started peeling away the layers. And I think that was the beginning of the end. Because now Jimmy, Jimmy Bulger was, was chewing off his body parts to stay on the street. He'd run out of people to give up. In December 1990, John Connolly decides to retire from the FBI. While in retirement during the mid-90s, he informs Whitey and Fleming that the indictments are coming down. Bulger reacted immediately. He had an escape plan all laid out. When you're a rat, you have to plan ahead. Stevie Fleming was, was riding around the financial district, and when the cops caught him, he thought it was a hit. He was screaming, don't shoot me, don't shoot me. You know, he thought it was a hit, but it wasn't a hit. It was a federal hit, and that's when they wrapped him up. Whitey's years of planning for life on the run become a reality. In 1995, Bulger goes on the lam and disappears into the great American landscape. Stevie Flemmy is left to face these charges. He's arrested, and he decides that his defense was, we were FBI informants and we had immunity from prosecution. The FBI told us that we could do anything short of murder. Uh, just don't clip anyone. But during the 1990s, more than 20 bodies around South Boston are unearthed. We believe that this was an original dig site, Left alone a real site. Once they started digging up the bodies of the women, I think things really changed. And, and it, it, there weren't too many people around Southie then who were saying, oh, he was really a good guy. It was disgusting. Oh, we're talking about women, girlfriends, stepdaughters. There was absolutely no rules with this crew. It was almost like it was fun. It became to them something that I think over time they began to enjoy. In May of 2002, John Connolly is convicted of taking bribes from his two most prized informants. He receives a 10-year sentence. And now he is facing new charges for conspiracy to murder. But the question still on everyone's mind is, where's Whitey? The one thing that Billy would never, ever do is disavow his brother. And Billy's not one that would talk about his brother in public, but if pressed, would say, he's my brother, I love him. No criminal underworld in the history of the United States lasts as long as the Irish mob. This is my union. And the shining beacon of Boston's gangland may be the final ghostly reminder of a bloody saga that began over a century and a half ago in the land of hope and opportunity. And there was a, an absolute sort of ruthless side of American capitalism that's always existed. And no one ever experienced an uglier side of that face than, I think, the Irish immigrants who came first. And they literally had to form into various groups to, to sort of overcome those hurdles. And they made it easier for every immigrant group that came after them. The legacy of it is this framework still exists. And so that you see newer immigrant groups try to get involved in the levers of power, whether it be financial or whether it be political. It's no longer Irish and Italian. It's now more recently arrived ethnic groups. It's the Russian Mafia. It's the Latin American narco traficantes. It's the Yugoslavians. It's Dominicans and Jamaicans that get involved in the narcotics trade. But you see the model for that in the history of the Irish mob in the United States. Our forefathers did the work. We're supposed to be the lawyers, we're supposed to be the doctors, we're supposed to be the CEOs. If you're running around trying to be a gangster, you're way behind the times. <laughs>